1963, Birmingham, Alabama was a heartland for the civil rights movement. It was also a battleground for the violence of racial segregation. On September 15th of that same year, four black girls met an untimely death when a bomb went off in their Sunday school church. The years since then have brought a 1977 conviction of Klansman Robert Dynamite Bob Shambliss, several failed attempts to reopen the investigation, and a 1983 seminal article written in the New York Times Magazine. The article, written by Howell Raines, piqued the interest of then-novice filmmaker Spike Lee. But it wouldn't be for another 15 years before the film would actually be made. Here is a look at the trailer from Spike Lee's new documentary, Four Little Girls. In a fortuitous turn of events, the FBI announced last week that they were reopening the case. Joining me now to discuss the Birmingham bombing, past and present, filmmaker Spike Lee and Howell Raines, New York Times journalist and native of Birmingham. I am pleased to have both of them. Here is the uh, Birmingham bombing, the Howell Raines story uh, that Spike read and put into his brain at that time, something that he might want to do about 20 years later, the case that won't close. This was written July 24, 1983. Where are we today with respect to reopening the case and the likelihood they'll turn up accomplices of Mr. Shambliss, who died in prison in, what, 80-something? Uh, this case has such a complicated and long history, I think it's impossible to predict where, what might happen now. But what we do know is what the FBI has said, that they are looking at the same group of people that they were looking at uh, at the time of the Chambliss uh, prosecution. They say they have new information. They've released no details. That's understandable. Uh, one of the three principal listed suspects, I emphasize they're suspects, no charges have ever been brought against these three people, uh, was interviewed uh, within the last few days in Texas, a man named Bobby Frank Cherry, now 69 years old. Uh, there are two other uh, men listed in the FBI records as suspects, Herman Frank Cash and Thomas Blanton, Jr. Uh, it's not known to me uh, at this moment whether they have re-interviewed uh, them, but that's where they're looking. Okay. It is fair to say, and I think I've even read this, that they would not have reopened unless they thought they had something, because they don't want to be embarrassed. I think that's true, Charlie, but uh, I, Bill Baxley, the attorney general in Alabama, who's in Spike's film and is one of the heroes, I mean, he, Bob Chambliss would not have gone to prison if, if Bill Baxley hadn't reopened this case in the mid-70s at great political risk, told me uh, the other day that he's worried because uh, there are so many dead ends on this case that look promising. Uh, and uh, there's the po he was saying that, that he hopes that they are reviewing his prosecution to see what's already been looked at and dispensed with. We don't know at this moment uh, uh, exactly what the status there is. Okay, let me go all the way back. Tell me about reading this and, and what's happened in the intervening years for you and, and why now at this time you come forward with this documentary. Well, I had graduated from NYU Film School, three-year program. I finished uh, 82. Well, I read the article and um, I had heard about it from my parents, but I was deeply moved by reading Howell's in death article and uh, looked in the phone book and found Chris McNair in Birmingham, Alabama and wrote him a letter on a whim saying, uh, will you give me permission uh, to make a, a, a narrative film, a dramatic film about your daughter Denise? Of course, he didn't answer it because, you know, he didn't know me from Adam and uh, I had, this was another three years before, she's got to have it. So. What's really happened is that uh, everything is timing, and uh, in the course of, of a, a decade and doing 10 films, uh, gained some expertise, you know, in, in filmmaking. So this rolled around, and this was the right time to do it. And how did you go about doing it? Well, I had the idea, I knew I wanted to do it, and so it was just a matter of who's going to pay for it, and I just called up Sheila Nevin at HBO. She runs the documentary branch at HBO, and I pitched the story. I said, fine, let's go. How much is it going to cost? I told her it. Of course, we went over budget. <laughs> but they, you know, they weren't kicking and screaming, and 
Just got the film made just like that. So we started shooting last August, Charlie. Yeah. And did you get most everybody that you wanted to cooperate with the film? Oh, uh, we wanted to interview Blanton, but uh, <laughs> he wouldn't get in front of the camera. And there, there were more people of the, the Adam and Collins family who liked to get, but they were, we really couldn't find them. And you hope people come away from this film beyond the tragedy mm -hmm. with a momentum to uh, stimulating people to double up the efforts to find whether they were accomplices? No, not at all. We did this film because I wanted the audience to, to really come to know the four girls that, who are no longer here. The personal story. Personal story. We wanted uh, when people after seeing this film, we want them to know these four girls who were, whose lives were cut short. Okay, here are two of the people that you will meet. Take a look. This is from the film. When my daughter, Denise, was uh, about six years old, and I've always despised going shopping uh, with my wife uh, because my patience doesn't hold for go shopping, you know. But at any rate, this was Christmas, and we were shopping. And we had come to a store, in fact, it was Cressus, uh, going in there to buy some ribbons. And when we got into Cressus, uh, Denise said she had to go to the restroom. So we went downstairs where the restroom were, black and white again, uh, black and color, I beg your pardon, white and color. And uh, so when we got down there, the lunch counter was also in there, and you could smell the onion, the hamburgers, and Denise said she wanted a sandwich. And it was kind of painful to say, no, you can't have it. She wanted to know why. And we had to tell her the sage old story about whites only can eat here, but we can't. We'll eat when we get home. She didn't understand that so hard. That was the night that I made up my mind that I guess I had to tell her that she couldn't have that sandwich because she was black. I guess for men, it's worse than it is for women because they are more sensitive, or I guess that's what you might call it. They hate to say, well, my child can't do what everybody else's child can do, and it makes me mad that I can't do anything about it. I can't change it right now. Well, I want you to know that night couldn't have been any more painful than seeing her laying up there with a rock smashed in her head than to tell her that I couldn't buy her that sandwich down there because she was black. And I'm not sure she ever understood that. What happens in this film is you come to know the people that died and the people that survived them, which is a powerful statement. It also helps you appreciate it, and how it helped me understand this, how this was different than just one more terrible act of violence in the Civil Rights Revolution. Uh, as Dr. King said, and as Andy Young says in the film, Birmingham was the place where segregation ended. And this event was the event that not only was pivotal along with the demonstrations that preceded the church bombing and changing segregation, but I think this was the event that changed Birmingham internally. Birmingham was never the same. Uh, the, the white resistance to segregation was never the same. Uh, and it's... It, to see the images in Spike's film, Fred Shuttlesworth being beaten in the street, uh, to see the McNairs, whom I've known now for over 20 years, reminds me of the world that existed prior to September 15th, 1963. It's literally disappeared. That's one of the reasons that I uh, have been obsessed, I guess, is, is maybe only slightly too strong a word with this story for over 20 years and one of the reasons this film moved me so much because this world no longer exists and that that's part of what this event was about it's about many other things uh, like like many other things including well it's about human loss tremendous loss it's with one of the things i'll say courage also i think yeah. that for me that was one of the most amazing things in making this film is interviewing the parents and relatives and knowing the loss they suffered 34 years but the courage they've had to go on and keep living and still knowing every night they had they go to bed with this nightmare of, of knowing that their child had been murdered and and being a 
young parent myself, it really put it into context. And my wife, Ty, and I have both said that we know what we would do if anything happened to our two children. So, uh, you know, I just have nothing but love for all the parents and relatives because, you know, it's, it's courageous what they've been able to do and get through it without hate. That's another thing. How about you? Did you get through it? Oh, I, I mean, Charles, I think that uh, if they got through with the, without hate, how could I hate anybody? So, uh, I mean, in reading some reviews, they were like, of this film, Spike's not angry. Yeah, so <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 another one said Spike has mellowed. It's ridiculous. First of all, forget about me. Just, just look what's... This film was not about me, you know, it's a documentary, and we just turned the camera on and let these people speak and tell their stories. How do you like making documentaries? Oh, I love it. I love it. I mean, I've always wanted to do it, but, but beyond that, Charlie, I'm a filmmaker, so whether it's a documentary, it feature film, commercials, music videos, you know, you know, I love all the different mediums. Tell me about the encounter with Governor Wallace. <laughs> Well, we wrote <clears throat> the governor, and his office said, fine. I think one of the reasons why they agreed to interview because they're, in the, they're trying to do this revisionist history act with him because, you know, I don't think the governor's going to be with this that much longer, so they want to try to change his place in history. So they saw it as an opportunity to do this, and we got there. It was like 100 press people. They're really trying to make it th this into a media event. They wanted a, a photo op. They wanted me to take pictures with the former governor, you know, and, and I squashed all that stuff. And so we just, as you know, he's deaf, so we printed out the questions so he could read them. And then we just turned the camera on, and he just took over. And he just pulled Ed, his assistant, <laughs> his black assistant, <laughs> from the side twice, you know, that, we, that was not any trickery we did with the filmmaking. And uh, he's really kind of pathetic. What do you think of Governor Wallace today? Well, no one can fail to have human sympathy for the terrible agony that he's gone through since he was shot. He said that he knows what it is to suffer. There was a thorn put in his flesh. But as someone who was watching television the day that he made that speech that's in this film, I have to say that I can't forget how much of this he created, uh, he, he bears responsibility for by creating an environment with it that was conducive to it. John Young, one of the prosecutors in this case, said in the Birmingham News the other day, he said, I don't want anyone to forget George Wallace was responsible for the climate. events, Atmosphere. the climate that, that made this happen. And you have to understand, this church bombing followed a summer of provocations. Wallace sending the highway patrol into Birmingham uh, at the time of the demonstrations in May and June. Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door in uh, midsummer, uh, spouting defiance at the Supreme Court and the, or the federal courts and the federal government. Wallace going into Tuskegee and, and superseding a local superintendent who was peaceably abiding with uh, desegregation orders. Then this cataclysmic event, the unspeakable event uh, on September 15th. And of course, George Wallace denounced it. Uh, but even put up a... And put up a reward. reward right? uh, one of the th and one of the things we now know was that his public service director helped disrupt the investigation. But Wallace was the state of Alabama in those days. His power was as close to absolute as it gets in a democratic situation. And the cl Reverend Joseph Lowry, SCLC, told me of a, a conversation he had with Wallace one time he was in the governor's office. Wallace was meeting with Dr. King and some others. And Reverend Lowry said, he turned to Wallace and said, I want to speak to you not as a civil rights leader and member of SCLC and you not as a governor, but I want to speak to you as a Methodist minister to a Methodist layman, and I want you to think about the fact that God is watching what's happening in Alabama, and he'll hold you accountable. Well, I'm not a theologian, and I wouldn't go as far as Joseph Lowry about who's accountable for what, but there was a core of truth there that uh, can't be denied. What did Wallace say to that, did he think, when Lowry put it to him? Uh, as I recall, Lowry told me Wallace said, 
that he would think seriously about that. I mean, he's a courtly uh, man. But there's no question that what Lowry said was that when you shout defiance, the man in the street who's prone to violence takes it as an excuse to pick up a club or a stick of dynamite. Especially if it's the highest authority in the state. Yeah. Why do you think Shamless denied guilt to the end? Code of Honor, uh, name me a clan oath, I don't know, but uh, what's, what's, what I find <laughs> troubling is that they know who did it. I mean, a couple days after the bomb went off, I think everybody knew who did it. And uh, Jay, Some of the names Jay, that he mentioned? Yes, yeah, so all those guys. And Jago Hoover knew that too, and they did a lot to the thwart, you know, the case. So, I mean, this is, this, supposedly it's a different FBI you know, the, the day we live in, so... Uh. Well, one, one thing I want to be careful, Spike, we know in court of law, one person's been convicted, and we oh, okay. need to be very careful here for legal reasons, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I'm proudest of, the thing I am proudest of in, in, in that article, uh, yeah. Charlie, is I showed through FBI documents there that had never been disclosed before, that in 1965, J. Edgar Hoover personally overruled the FBI agents in Birmingham who wanted to make a case uh, in court, take Chambliss to trial, and Hoover uh, refused them permission to give their evidence to the U.S. Attorney. So S Spike is right that the same body of information that is extant today was known, uh, fully known between 1963 and 65. Hoover blocked the prosecution, presumably, in or this is my presumption because I think he didn't want to do anything that would help the civil rights movement or reflect favorably on Dr. King. Who he hated. Who he hated. Sure. That's, that's a historical fact. Um, why do you think Chambliss never talked? I visited Chambliss twice in uh, prison, and as I told Spike in his film, he is the most, was the most pathological racist that I've ever known. He was sworn into the Ku Klux Klan in a public ceremony in a Birmingham park in the 1920s, the Robert E. Lee Clavern of the Ku Klux Klan. And I believe that he, unlike many other members of the Klan leaders, took absolutely seriously the oath never to betray any Klan secret or Klan member, and he was willing to die for it. And the reason I visited him twice was that I wanted, I said to him, you will die in prison unless you tell what you know. And I'm here to tell you, I'm a journalist, I'm here for the reason I want to write a story. If you will tell me what you know, it'll be published and things will then proceed. And I think you would have a good chance of using your knowledge to alleviate your situation. And he uh, was delusional to this degree, he thought that George Wallace, who was now being elected in the late 70s on black votes, he thought George Wallace was going to pardon him. And there was no, there was no chance of that happening. But at bottom, uh, he, uh, he simply couldn't bring himself to, to turn on fellow Klansmen. In my view, I think it was Spike's initial comment was, was right on the money. And, and he never would... Just never acknowledged anything. It was always, I didn't do it, and therefore I can't talk about no, it. No, not that. Yes, he always said that. But he also described in great detail, I think this is in the film mm -hmm. too. Yes. He said, I know who planted the bomb, and he named people. And he told in great detail what happened, where it was put, how they got away. And I realized at some point in the narrative, he was telling me exactly what had in fact happened, the story of, the, of the, that night but substituting other characters for himself and the real participants. Was the bomb thrown or was it planted? No, it was planted beside the building. By uh, entrance? Beside the, the you, you remember, the side there's entrance. a side entrance where the children were uh, just inside the wall. And by most, by the counts that the FBI has, the person carrying the box with the dynamite was let out a block away, came down the alley, came down the side of the church, set it against the wall outside the Sunday school room, walked around to the front of the church, and by that time, the people that dropped him off had come around and uh, picked him up. And it was at that point of the pickup, 
car door opens, the light comes on that Mrs. Curtis Glenn from Detroit, visiting the city, looks in the window and looks Bob Chambliss in the face. And it was that, per that uh, first-hand ID that, that uh, put Chambliss in the position of being the only one uh, who ever went to prison. And what was his sentence? Life. And he died in 80-something? Died in 85. Heart did, disease? Did or what David was it? Van ever testify that he saw Shambles stand on the corner like a, the firebug? No, that's, uh, David, uh, Mayor, Mayor David Van of Birmingham. Uh, Which he said in the film. Yeah, a memorable quote. Uh, he saw Chambliss standing there like looking at the church like a firebug watching his fire. But he was not called uh, in the, I'm sure he would have been witness, yeah. willing to. I don't know why they didn't put him on the stand. Any other unanswered questions for you other than who else was involved in this bombing? No, I don't think that's really the re main reason why we... No, I didn't say that. I mean, what questions that you wanted to know answer to and you couldn't find? Not that this was the main reason you did this. I wanted to know who the, who the girls were. That, that was really the... Your film was about who the victims were, not who right. the... Yeah, I know. We were trying to do an Oliver Stone number. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. Here is Chambliss right here. Uh, Birmingham today. Tell me about your town today. Uh, it's an entirely different city. The major issue, industry was steel and iron when I was there. Tough work, tough people. Uh, Today, the major employer is a hospital and a university, white-collar work, computers, great cancer center, great heart center, uh, difference between a white-collar town and a blue-collar town, difference between a town with its own resources and one owned by an outside corporation that cared nothing for the uh, community. And the status of, and the state of race relations? Race relations in Birmingham have the same tensions they have everywhere in America, but like many southern cities, it has, in my judgment, Spike may have a different view from his time there, more real integration at the political and social levels than you see in the Northeast. Because of prior experience in living with? I think that's part of it. Yeah. More, more contact. More contact, yeah. Did you find any, any attitude when you went down to do this film? Many no, people nobody say... Nobody even knew we were there, so... We were just there. I mean, we were we weren't announcing it, and uh, one of the good things about doing a documentary film is you have to be like a detective. So a lot of the people who are in the <laughs> film, I didn't, I, didn't, I had no idea who they were, and we had to find them. You know, people would give us a tip and we'd call them up and stuff like that. But uh, we had a good time. Anybody who didn't want to talk? Oh yeah, several people didn't want to talk. But Why not? It's painful. It's very painful, you know, for people to to recall that stuff, and a lot of people, you know, just want to forget about it, don't want to talk about it. But we were very happy with with the fact that we knew if we get Chris McNair, this is yeah. the gentleman we yes. saw talking Denise about his McNair's, daughter wanting yes. to eat the sandwich. If we, if we got him, everybody else would fall in line. He's such a well-respected uh, politician. Well, he has that him. much influence in terms. Yes. of... Yes. What's what's his? Position he is the, he was a state representative, and now he is on the county commission in right. uh, Birmingham. And I must say that, to me, as someone who's, who's lived with the story quite a while, seeing Chris and Maxine McNair and Alpha Robertson, and uh, who, who I know well and personally for a long time, and, and the other family members of the other families who I don't know personally, but seeing them in this setting, to me, was... Uh, to use a word I think it's best to be cautious with, redemptive in a way. I mean, uh, to see their family sacrifice recognized uh, was moving to me. The film is playing as we speak at the Film Forum. Yes. Lower Manhattan. In Lower Manhattan. Um, four Little Girls, an HBO production. We've seen HBO in February be broadcast. On, on HBO, but on first HBO. it's got a cinematic release. Right, we're going to be in nine other areas, excuse me, nine other areas. And playing in Birmingham? Yes, the phone's ringing off the hook. You gotta get a screening down there, quick. <laughs> All right, thanks for having us. Great to see you. No. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. We'll be right back. Stay with us.